Good morning. We'd like to welcome everyone to our second panel here at the symposium. My name is Holly McDonald. I'm with the um, Regent Journal of International Law. We um, are very excited to be sponsoring this panel today. Um, just a little bit about us. We um, have many students apply, get on the journal, and then they write about current or past international issues, hot topics. Um, and things of that nature. We will be merging um, with the Journal of Public Policy this upcoming year into the Journal of Global Justice and Public Policy. Um, we Just a few notes, reminders about this um, panel. Please turn off your cell phones, silence them, make sure they're completely off. Um, hold all questions to the end. You should have note cards. If you have a question, write it down and then we will collect them um, when the moderator asks for them. We, again, are so excited to have you here today, and I'm um, pleased to introduce Jim Davis, the director of our LLM program here at Regent University of Law. <clears throat> Greetings, everyone. This uh, panel is uh, supposed to last until uh, 1250, and I suspect it will not go that long simply because I get hungry right around 12. I assume that most of you do too, so I suspect uh, we will not go that long. Um, as the uh, uh, young lady just said, I'm Jim Davids. I'm uh, a professor in the law school here, and uh, I direct the LLM program. We uh, instituted a LLM in human rights uh, a year or two ago, and we're, uh, we're having our first class uh, coming up this coming fall. Uh, matter of fact, I, I saw the director of marketing for the law school uh, during our break, and I said, uh, Sean Kernan, don't we, ha don't we have some one sheets that shamelessly promote our LLM and human rights? He said, of course we have. Uh, so if you see someone passing out a sheet concerning that program, please uh, accept it. If uh, you aren't interested in the program, uh, you might know of somebody who is. So. Uh, uh, let us know about that. It's a, a brand new program and, and frankly is a, a fulfillment of, of the Dean's dream and many of, of the other people here because uh, this is something that, that touches all of us uh, and is uh, something that is uh, certainly within our Christian mission here at, at the university as well as uh, uh, us generally as Christians. All right. Uh, first speaker today is a person of whom uh, I periodically get envious. At least once a year, I get envious of uh, Brian Dennison, who is a very, very much a friend of the university. Brian is a, uh, a graduate of uh, the University of Georgia. I'm not envious about that. <laughs> he got a JD, MBA, and degree in English, all from uh, University of Georgia. Uh, practiced law in Savannah for several, several years. But now he is the senior lecturer in the Faculty of Law at Uganda Christian University. And that's the university that, that our law school has developed a relationship with. And during the course of the summer, several uh, of our students will go over to Uganda Christian University where they will uh, be tutored by, um, uh, by Brian as well as others and, and focus upon human rights issues uh, at uh, Uganda Christian University. One of the things that they, two of the things that they do out there that, that I'm envious of is, is whitewater rafting, if I'm ever right, correct? Whitewater rafting. Whitewater rafting. I'm not sure about, uh, is it alligators or crocs in, in that part of... They got rid of the crocs. They, they got rid of the crocs? All right, all right. So, but that, that's always intrigued me, although how far from the Victoria Falls are we? I mean... Different river. Different water. Okay, excellent. <laughs> I get I, a little nervous about things such as that. Yeah, I'm a former tort lawyer, so I, it's the way I think, all right? Uh, and uh, another thing that they do is they also go on a safari, if I remember right. Yeah. Not sure exactly if they're shooting by means of cameras or something else, but uh, that's another cool thing that's done. So, so Brian is, is in a very unique uh, position, uh, very, very good friend of the school, so please welcome Brian Dennison. All right, thank you, Jim. And so I pre presume my presentation will magically appear behind me. Um, I guess before I get into the presentation, let me just, first of all, since I'm Ugandan, sort of, been there for six years, the first thing I have to do is say, praise the Lord. That's what you do in Uganda. 
Yes, and you also bring greetings. So I do bring greetings from Uganda Christian University in Makono. We are fresh off celebrating our 100th year as an institution. Originally started as a theological college, Bishop Tucker, and we've been a university since 1997, and we have various friends of the institution here and other friends that were here at Regent, so I feel at home here, even though I haven't been home in about a year and eight months. So a quick story. So when you drive around, maybe this is an experience and a story combined, but when you drive around and you're in line in the interstate, and then that person decides that they're just not going to follow the rules and they go off the side of the road and then they try to get in and you're sitting there, right? And you're just like, oh, you know, and you're hoping that other person won't let them in and you get the chance not to let them in. If you go to Uganda and you have that emotion, you will die of a heart attack or something will happen to you. And it's, it may be the greatest difference between maybe an American and a Ugandan is, is how we react to that situation, like someone cutting in line. I know that sounds like an overstatement, but bear with me. Because I think it goes to what's in our DNA as Americans is we feel like if everybody just plays by the rules, everybody does what they're supposed to do, things are going to work a lot better. So if you just stay in the line and you do that, then, you know, you'll get there eventually and we won't have to worry about all the other people blocking the other people and, and we'll just get there. And there's a lot of emotions like that where you feel as an American, man, if we could just, you know, can't we all just cooperate and play by the rules together and it'll be okay. And the Ugandan is just like, but you know, nobody else is going to follow the rules, you know. And, and that's what they're going to do. I might follow the rules, but they can do what they're going to do. And, and I don't worry about it. I've got I've to take care of myself because ultimately Uganda isn't going to take care of me. I can take care of my family maybe, or my family can take care of me. Close friends can take care of me. So uh, I, th I think when we think about the rule of law, there's also something that's very big, just that, that core expectation of what you can expect from society. And a place like Somalia, of course, has even less expectations. But in Uganda, there's just not a lot of expectations of what society is going to do for you. It's can you survive? Can you navigate this place the best you can? And I think, obviously, one of the big things I'm going to talk about in a second about a tipping point. But rule of law, you have to have a tipping point. You have to have a buy-in that this system can work. And I think that's a big problem with a lot of people in Uganda is they don't feel like the system can work. They feel like it's broken. They don't understand it. It's too expensive. It's for other people. And uh, anyway, so we're going to talk about barriers in the Ugandan context, uh, barriers that prevent the rule of law from being advanced. There's your map of Uganda. We have a very Ugandan uh, flavor to the festivities here, which is great, but it, I think it has to do with the relationship that Jim's talking about. So I think that uh, I'm sure Regent would, would they could, they'd like to have, and there's other issues to talk about, even especially we could even talk about Eastern Congo as, as an East African issue as well as South Sudan, as the ICC controversy in Kenya, as Somalia. I mean, there's a lot of very, interesting and tragic and important things happen in East Africa, but uh, we're going to focus a bit more on Uganda maybe than we will the other places because of the relationships. So there you see, that's where I'm there on the map. You look down at the lake. We do have a Lake Victoria. We okay. just don't have Victoria Falls. So we got, we got Lake Victoria there and uh, Makono, which means hand, is right there, right over Victoria. You see the word Victoria. So that's where, that's where we are, just for your reference. And Kampala is there 20 kilometers to the west, and as, as we went over last night at dinner, it is the size of Oregon. That's the official geographic thing you're supposed to know. Okay, so next, uh, next slide, please. We're going to save the barriers as surprises, get them one at a time. So I've got to click. Okay, magic. All right, so first, lang first barrier, language. So this is your map of language uh, groups in Africa. You know, you've got down the lower left, you have the languages where people click and things like that. And then you've got the big purple swath of Zulu languages. And then you've got some Nilo-Sahara languages. If you know, we see the big blue spot, that's 
Lake Victoria and you can see that Uganda is in a place where uh, some colors come together and you could add another color too if you wanted to add like Kushite languages. So you've got like 50, 40, 50, 60 languages, depends on who's counting. You know, is Norwegian a language or not? I mean, who's counting the languages? So um, lots of languages. Uh, and Swahili really didn't take off in Uganda for various reasons. People have different theories, Tanzanian, Idi Amin, different things, why they say people don't know Swahili. So English is the universal language. Um, and so English is a language of the courts, obviously for colonial reasons as well. But it's not what most people are speaking as their day-to-day -day language. So you have a court system that exists in one language and you exist in another language. This makes you not want to go to court. It's not a surprise. The Ugandan constitution has a provision that says we're going to put the constitution in all the languages in Uganda. I have finally, after four years of trying, I have now paid for my own photostat copy of the Luganda constitution, which I finally received. Uh, I think we have the best working version of the Rancoli constitution at UCU that our students have worked on putting together. And I think that's about it. Um, and this constitution, you know, it, it's, it's not new. Uh, it's 17 years old or so. So uh, this requirement is out there to do this and it hasn't been done. So of course the Ugandans, what are they going to say? The can you expect the government to do something for you? You can't expect the government necessarily to translate the constitution into the language you speak, even though the constitution says it was supposed to. And a lot of time has gone by. Um, and it creates interesting situations, wills. So with, we work with International Justice Mission. We go around and help people write wills, which is great. Because usually people respect the wills and they help things go better at the time of death with property, succession, these things. And they'll say, oh, by the way, you can write this will in your local language. Oh, great. And so some people choose to write the will in the local language, which is cool. But when it has to go to court, at the end of the day, when it, when it has to go to the probate process, by law, it has to be translated. And so there's professors sitting around at McCary that make extra money translating wills into Luganda, right? Because they're the only official translators. So you've told these people they can have it in their own language, but then they've got to pay to have a translation done by a translation professional. And these are the kind of things. Well, why, why couldn't they just probate it in the language? Why can't you have somebody that knows the language and just probate it in that area? But you have these kind of barriers, and it keeps people on the outside looking in. Uh, resources and capacity, this was gone over earlier, and it's sort of the obvious one. Um, uh, this is supposed to be a picture, I think, of someone getting ready to go to the local council court. This is very typical, people going to court under mango trees and with, with local individuals. Um, and it's a great idea in, as far as ideas go, um, but in terms of implementation, it's a program that often isn't funded and now the legal capacity of it to render decisions is called into question because uh, people on local councils were supposed to be replaced by law, they weren't, and so now they're basically, it's sort of mediation effectively, wouldn't you say, Edward? I mean, it's not real because whatever they do has no legal mandate because they haven't replaced the officials that are supposed to be there that make it a legally active body. So no capacity, no resources. Sounds great and is good on the ground. And so what are people doing? They're making it work anyway, right? I can't afford to go to court. I don't speak English. Yeah, they say this court isn't real. Yeah, they don't keep records. Yeah, I've got to pay these people to show up, but it's the best option I've got. So people are still going to these courts uh, and doing these sorts of things. So resources and capacity, but you can go on and on and on. But oftentimes there's ways to get around resources and capacity. Um, like in this case, there's an easy solution to capacity, right? Re-up the local council members officially and get them legally recognized again. That could be done. Political reasons, I guess it's not being done. Um, all right, then I've got this one. It's sticky colonialism, all right? Sticky colonialism. What is sticky colonialism? Well, first of all, you see that uh, Lady Justice there has a wig on her head, right? But people like the wigs in Uganda, so you don't want to be down on the wigs. It does add pomp and circumstance to the process. Now, the younger generation may not be as big on the wigs, but I think the wigs are okay. It's more about 
the aspect of colonialism, not about whether you wear a wig, but whether you feel that you have dominion over your own legal system or, or you feel that you just got this legal system from somebody else and you're curating it like those computers that you keep in the basement um, in Afghanistan because you don't want to mess it up. And I think in Uganda, you've had the we don't want to mess it up attitude. I, I know that at least uh, Professor Lawrence Adams over there, he's, he's read my article, so like one person knows what I'm talking about. So. But I do have links at the end, so you can, you, can, you can get on the link and you can read things that I've that I've written if you really want to spend time slogging through some stuff that's more substantive, but I'm trying to use my time the right way here. And so I have an article that sort of explains this aspect of colonialism more. But a great example is in the context of customary law. So we heard uh, earlier talk about customary law. What is that? That's the common law basically of Uganda. It's the law that existed on the ground, the people that were there, of how they handled their matters. So the British come in and they have common law. And so the common law becomes the real common law and the customary law becomes something that it goes away essentially unless people are practicing it in their own places as long as they don't take it to court and take it up different levels. Um, now, Uganda has provisions that recognize customary law in marriage and in other contexts. But the problem is proving customary law in court is very difficult. The, the judges can't just know customary law. The customary law is treated like a fact. So you imagine if you're a, if you're a lawyer and instead of just citing Lexis or Westlaw and, and you know, finding your case and, and citing your Supreme Court case, every time you wanted to try a customary law case, you had to prove the law, not just the facts. And how do you prove the law? By finding the oldest man in town and trying to see if he can remember how everything was since time immemorial and tell you what it was because he must be the only one that knows what everything has been since time immemorial, because that's what the law is, some law that has you know, been around forever. It's fine if you've got tablets that came from Mount Sinai, you can say, that, that's the law, there it is, right? But if you don't, it becomes very difficult. So you have this customary law, it's what people are practicing, but because you adopt the colonial attitude towards how customary law is proven that was established by the British courts that were in East Africa, you basically disempower the judges and disempower litigants from having the customary law recognized in the formal court system. Legal pluralism. So why do I have pictures of ladies when I talk about legal pluralism? Um, and we talked about hybrids. This is sort of like hybrids. It's all these different forms of law that are existing at once. It's because women are the most problematic aspect. You know, when we're hearing talking about Sharia law, we hear... Uh, we want to talk about people's hands getting chopped off and we want to hear about women having to, you know, not drive or whatever, right? She was careful not to mention those sort of stereotypical aspects of Sharia law. But when it comes to legal pluralism, you can't get around the issue of how women are treated. There's, there's no way around it. And with these customary laws, oftentimes they're patr patrilineal. Uh, and so that means that all the property is going to go through the man typically. If there's a death, the woman would go back to her old family and leave, and the family would often take, just keep the children, and she'd go back, go her way. Obviously, you're treating women different. You're saying they can't have property. The, the, the Islamic laws, they have their own rules about property too. So you have a constitution that says men and women have to be treated the same, and everything has to be according to the constitution. But when you start stripping out the different treatment of women and men from a law of succession system, the whole law of succession system doesn't make sense anymore because what the law of succession did was it kept the land and the same people, kept it going right there. And when you have both sides of families claiming interest to land and going different ways, things get very complicated. So the system worked okay, but it wasn't constitutional. It's still done on the ground. So how do you deal with the reality that it's still done on the ground? So different people are engaging it and they're trying to say, well, we can change customary law. We can make customary law so it meets standards of human rights, standards of our constitution. They do that in South Africa. They do that in Namibia. They don't do that really in Uganda. They just, it's all or nothing. It's time immemorial. What was time immemorial? Is it in line with these principles? If it's not, it's repugnant cut it down. 
Well, that's fine as long as you can take it to court. But if you're living in a legal system that is in your own language and isn't going to court, you're living in a parallel world. You're living outside of that rule of law. You're living in a different rule of law. So it's not really, whoops, that's, that's a bad button. That's called power. Let's see. Here we go. Um, oh, another, another barrier, I'd say it, it's all related, it's sort of an immature common law system, which is related to that sticky colonialism. And I've got an article, if you want to read it too, that it'll, it'll be linked to that kind of talks about this. And the example is there's this case. Uh, it's a United States Supreme Court case from 1904. It's called South Dakota versus North Carolina. It's an 11th Amendment bond case, you know, where what happened is once they passed the 11th Amendment, um, people couldn't sue states. There were all these Confederate states that had a bunch of bonds that they weren't honoring. People realized they couldn't recover against the Confederate states directly. So what do they do? They go to places like South Dakota and sell their bonds on the cheap. And South Dakota says, hey, we still have an article in the Constitution that allows us to go after other states. So we're going to try it out. And the Supreme Court said, Yes, you can, South Dakota. You, you've, you've, you've scored big. You can, you can collect these bonds. You've made a nice purchase for yourself, a tidy profit. Had to tide them over until they discovered all this petroleum or whatever they've done now in South Dakota. They're doing well again in South Dakota. So there's this case, and it's got a dissenting opinion from a judge that says you have to read the Constitution as a whole, basically. It's, it's, a, it's a dissent. It's not the majority opinion. Somehow this case became part of you got in jurisprudence because a very famous judge named Justice Kenny Hamba decided he was going to cite it for this principle. He cited the case wrong. He called it, he, he had the wrong date. So no one ever read the case because it wasn't cited correctly. No one really knew where it was, but people kept citing the case and they started calling it Smith, Dakota. They started calling it South Carolina, South Carolina, different things because they weren't reading the law. So they're in a common law system, but they're not reading the case. And this case has been cited, I don't know, 15 times in Uganda. In three recent high-profile cases in Kenya, it was cited. The, 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 the Kenyatta case, I mean, you know, the presidential election case, it was cited incorrectly. Because people aren't reading the case, right? They're simply taking law really as aphorisms and saying, this is a principle, this is a principle. But who can blame them? Because building a common law, a thick common law, is difficult, right? Building a common law that really has careful distinctions between factual situations is difficult. And when you come from a colonial heritage where you didn't get the right to mess with the law in the first place, are you really going to think you have the power and the license to make your own common law in a meaningful way? So instead, common law almost becomes like the law of equity, just a bunch of principles. So corruption, no. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell is not corrupt. Um, the, the point of putting uh, Malcolm's mug there is that it's important uh, to reach a tipping point. This is something that Edward and I have talked about before. In Uganda, I think with ethics, right now, if you practice law in Uganda, it's very hard to be ethical. It's really hard to do things the right way. We have someone on the panel that actually does that. It's really exciting. And he, and he inspires the students at UCU, at my, my, my university, because he comes and tells them, you can do it. You don't have to pay bribes. You can do it this way. It took me a while to get my reputation, but now I have it, and now they don't mess with me. So if you just, if you just do it the right way long enough and be a little patient and put off having that really nice car for five or six years or 10 years, or I guess in your case, 15 years. I forget his story about how long it took him to get the nice car eventually you'll get there. But I think in Uganda, there has to be enough advocates that think you can practice law doing it the right way. And they're not there right now. And it takes, you know, it takes a lot of, it take a lot of cloning or a lot of instilling something in our young people. And I know that, uh, you know, Mike Chibita is here, DPP, he's come to our university many times and given this talk. And we try to give this talk to our young people and say, you can do it. You can practice, and they walk away. Some of them have a gleam in their eye and say, I can, and then three of them are walking away going, Shh, you know, I know how it really works. I was at that law firm last, you know, during the break, and this is how you have to practice law in Uganda. So eventually reaching that tipping point where you can't get away with doing things corruptly, 
Where are we? How far away is it? I don't know. I guess the more things become electronic, I know you said technology is not the, not the answer, but the more things are technolo technological, the harder things become to fix. You got as a cash society, sure makes it easy to do things when everybody's running around with big wads of cash as, as opposed to every single thing happening on an electronic transaction. Um, but what sort of things are going to tighten things up? I think eventually things will get, will tighten up and eventually people will hold people more accountable and feel like you can't get away with things. But when everybody owes somebody else a favor, it becomes difficult. Uh, the last one, I'm not going to say culture because I don't think culture is bad. And we have some of the, our people that were here. We went to the dairy dance. We saw the dances. They were awesome, right? Jessica's shaking her head. There's awesome culture. And then in every culture, there's fallen culture. And Uganda's got some fallen culture, like child sacrifice. doesn't get much more fallen than that. Of course, we have our own fallen culture in terms of a, a death toll that I think we're all aware of um, in this country. But in Uganda, there's the sacrifice of children that happens. It's just horrible. It's just as bad as anything you can imagine. Fortunately, it doesn't happen just constantly, but it happens way, way, way more than anyone would like. And Peter's here. He's going to tell us about what his ministry does in, the, in, terms, of, in terms of these issues. Uh, one thing that's pretty cool, Heather and I wrote a paper along with another UCU student, and I've linked it here as well. And we've sent it to uh, Mike Chibita here to take a look at and see what he thinks. It's interesting because it addresses those things about new laws because it talks about we have a, tr we have a human trafficking law and it actually it addresses child sacrifice, interestingly enough, in the human trafficking law. But if anybody's interested in that, you can click on it. Um, but we're trying to engage and talk about, and we come to the similar conclusion. We don't need more laws about child sacrifice. We just need to enforce the law and we just need people to think that they know they can go after it. Um, other, other culture, I think that the one that's really devastating in Uganda is, um, is uh, it also has to do with children, the sexual, the sexual abuse of children. And it, and, it, and it puts a huge tax on, on the justice system, how many defilement cases take up high court dockets. And I think it takes a toll on the judges just have to see case after case and the prosecutors, case after case of, of sexual abuse to children. It, it makes the justice system something you don't want to be a part of because that's what's, if you go there, that's what you see on a high court session. A few murders and then, and then statute, essentially a statutory rape case after statutory rape case. Um, <clears throat> so addressing these issues of where culture has fallen um, is another challenge. All right. So there's where you can go if you want to read more about some of these things. We gave you the quick overview with, with pictures and all that good stuff and wanted to give time for questions and those things. So if you are interested in some of these issues, you can go there. Those papers aren't perfect. I mean, some of them are pending publication. Some of them are written for South African law reviews. So when you read them and you're a Regent student and you know your blue book rules, you know, don't throw me under the bus for, for not having any idea what I'm doing, okay? Um, so we're, we're, you know, it's, it's hard to try to keep up with like six different ways to cite stuff, but uh, you know, I don't always do it right. But yeah, we've got some papers there, including the paper Heather worked on. And so I think it's, a, it's, an interesting, it's interesting to see that one if you're interested in the issue of, of child sacrifice and also how it interacts with uh, a human trafficking law that's on the ground in Uganda. And with that, Jim, I think I'm finished with my time. Uh, yes, blue book rules. That's why God made graduate assistants. Second speaker, and thank you, Brian, for, uh, for focusing upon uh, the barriers that we have uh, in Uganda specifically. Uh, second speaker uh, this morning on our panel uh, dealing with overcoming uh, the barriers uh, to the rule of law is Kevin Cope. Uh, Kevin is a scholar. Kevin is a graduate of the Ohio State University over in Columbus, but then uh, attended uh, and graduated from Northwestern University School of Law in uh, my hometown of Chicago. He served on the Law Review over at Northwestern. Uh, he has uh, been in private practice. He has an LLM degree from Georgetown. Uh, he lives in Charlottesville and teaches a little bit at the University of Virginia and also commutes up to Washington, D.C., where he also teaches at Georgetown. He's an expert and, and, and is developing uh, his own scholarly work uh, and his interest is in international law and particularly nation building and law building and things such as that. And so um, uh, let us welcome Kevin Cope.
Thanks, Jim. So uh, on the way, I drove here from Charlottesville last night, and while I was driving, my glasses broke. Uh, the left earpiece is broken off. Unfortunately, I need them to see sometimes, so I'm going to wear them. I'm well aware that I look ridiculous with, with this, so maybe if I just turn this way, no one will notice and no one will say anything. Yeah. All right, so uh, like Cynthia, I am certainly not uh, an expert on East Africa. Uh, unlike Cynthia, I am also not an expert on rule of law. So you th that might uh, lead you to ask, what am I doing here? Um, the reason I'm here, I'm, I'm guessing the reason that they asked me to come is because I've made a study of constitutions from a comparative perspective, um, from a cross-country perspective. And I've used my study of constitutions uh, recently in a paper and in a book chapter where I used uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and in particular South Sudan as a case study. And so I've gotten to know a little bit about the, the structures and what's going on in South Sudan in the recent constitutional processes. Uh, so I'm going to talk about sort of constitutions and constitutional theory and that uh, the, the role of constitutions and the rule of law. So why look at constitutions and the rule of law? Constitutions are, are of course the foundation of law, at least in most countries that have constitutions, uh, and therefore arguably they are the, the foundation of rule of law. Constitutions are of course subject to many different influences and papers and, and books have been written about constitutional influences. I'm going to touch on that briefly today, but suffice it to say that there are both foreign and domestic uh, influences on constitutions of all sorts. And constitutions are, of course, they're not monoliths. They uh, have many different elements, but generally they're divided into two main elements, and that is the rights portion of the constitution, often called a bill of rights, and the structural portion, the portion that we say constitutes the government, sets up the government. So let me talk very briefly about the various theories of constitutional influence, and then I'll go into how that's relevant to uh, what's going on with rule of law in East Africa. So we can think of approaches to constitutional influence along uh, dividing into two different camps. The first is transnational, and the second is the Constitution's national product. And what do we mean by this? So first, transnational. So transnational view looks at constitutions as the product of a world system, uh, not in a vacuum, not developed by domestic forces, uh, but something, ideas that diffuse across borders. And there are numerous ideas about the motivations for why constitutions diffuse, why these ideas move across national borders. Um, one of the oldest is called um, uh, coercion. Uh, coercion. Uh, for example, in, when, when many of the African countries, uh, sub-Saharan African countries, gained independence in the 60s, the British Foreign Office simply wrote their constitution for them and said, if you want to become independent, you can have this constitution. So we have many of, of those countries who initially had basically a boilerplate, cut and pasted constitution written by Great Britain. So those were coerced constitutions. We don't have that so much anymore, but we do have what Noah Feldman at NYU has called soft coercion. He, he suggested that the constitutions of Iraq and Afghanistan were perhaps uh, soft coercion in that the United States didn't say that you have to adopt this model but they did, it was understood that you know, certain aid was contingent on adopting certain elements of a constitution. And as I'll discuss later, uh, those elements tend to be focused on the rights portion as opposed to the structural portion. Uh, there are other reasons. Sometimes countries want to uh, simply join a, an emerging trend in the community of states. If lots of other countries, if their neighbors, their rivals, their allies are adopting a right to free speech, uh, a right to religious freedom, then they want to join that community as well. Sometimes countries will adopt provisions as a form of economic competition. Uh, there's literature showing that countries will 
put in rights protections in constitutions because they know that it's more likely to attract foreign investment if uh, businesses can come in and know that their investments will be relatively safe. Uh, the literature also talks about the pathways by which these ideas, these constitutional ideas, diffuse. One of those, of course, is foreign consultants. That's probably the most visible way. When there's a new constitution writing process in a country, particularly if it's a developing country, uh, foreign consultants from usually the West will descend into the country, uh, places like the Max Planck Institute from the EU, the National Democratic Institute in the US, the US Institute of Peace, and others will come in and advise them both procedurally and substantively on what they should be putting in their constitutions. And of course, the people who write constitutions, the drafters, often will travel. They'll get to know each other, much like judges go to conventions and share ideas and judicial ideas transfuse. Um, constitutional drafters will get together and share their ideas at conventions. OK, so that's. Uh, the, the transnational. So what about Constitution as national product? This is a competing idea. People who talk about the Constitution as national product urge that the constitutions, the constitutions either are indescriptively or should be normatively the product of a domestic forces. It should be a unique uh, indigenous product. And it should reflect the identity of the nation. That can happen in rhetoric that's not judiciable, such as the preamble, where a country expresses its intent, its history in the preamble. It can be reflected in policy choices. Uh, some countries uh, that have a, a, a culture of, uh, of faith, of religion, will prohibit uh, abortion in their constitutions. Others uh, do not. Some cultures uh, prohibit the death penalty and others don't. Uh, there's also a focus on the role of national actors, a procedural focus, a thought that a constitution shouldn't be written by a handful of elites. It should be written by the country as a whole. And of course, that doesn't always happen, though uh, recently, in 2008, Iceland decided to draft a new constitution, and they actually did it via Facebook. So there were people who were chosen randomly from the entire country, granted the entire country is about the, the size of Richmond, but uh, I'm maybe a bit off there, but, and they were drafted to come up with ideas, and then you could run, anyone. You, they had truck drivers, mechanics, uh, lawyers, doctors, every walk of life running to be part of this constitutional convention. Uh, and then they got feedback via Facebook. Uh, that ultimately ended up failing, but uh, not for lack of trying. And then uh, sort of a competing idea is that in reality, though we might like the Icelandic model, uh, often constitutions are the result of, are drafted by, uh, by elites, uh, by, by power holders within government. And that those elites will often, in drafting the constitution, will draft provisions that serve themselves because they anticipate being part of the ruling class after the constitutional adoption. And so we see that in, in many parts of the world. So we have, on one hand, transnational constitutionalism, and on the other hand, constitution as domestic, unique national product. So these two would seem to conflict. How can these two be reconciled? So I argue that they actually can be reconciled. They don't need to conflict. And the reason is, in what I call the intermestic constitution, is that the transnational and the domestic affect constitutions in predictable ways, not random ways. How is that? The rights provision, the transnational, rights provisions are mostly influenced by transnational forces. And the structural provisions, the, the parts that set up the government, tend to be most strongly influenced by domestic forces. So why does this happen? First, rights and transnationalism. It turns out that, that this can be explained largely by a series of, of cost-benefit analyses, looking at, bo at both the drafters themselves and the international community. So it turns out there are, as to rights, there are many benefits and few costs to 
uh, acceding to, to copying foreign norms in your Bill of Rights of a Constitution. It turns out, of course, that many constitutions are what we call cheap talk. They have a beautiful, robust Bill of Rights, uh, but most of those rights are ignored or otherwise not enforced. And so if I'm a drafter and I expect to be in the government afterwards, uh, there, it's no problem for me to put in a lot of provisions about free speech and limited government and so forth, because I know those simply won't be enforced. And uh, you know, my, I have a history, the, the last constitution, there was little enforcement, and I expect that there won't be in the next one. So there are a few costs in that respect. Conversely, doing so has great benefits, because the international community, these foreign consultants, as well as countries, uh, tend to reward countries that put these, these uh, boilerplate terms in their constitution. If you don't have a robust right to free speech or protection of religious freedom uh, or other sorts of plural, pluralism, you'll be named and shamed. But if you do have those provisions, uh, then you'll be recognized for having a robust, progressive, uh, egalitarian constitution. And the international community really tends to focus on rights as opposed to structure. Um, so you see these groups that go in, the Max Planck and the NDI, uh, when they come out, they say we were influential in helping South Sudan or Egypt write its constitution. Look at all these beautiful rights that are in the constitution now. You see very little boasting and very little pressure about structures, about uh, bicameralism or separation of powers. Um, you know, why that is is sort of a topic for another day. It may not be as sexy as protection of uh, free, freedom of speech or protection for women, um, but, but there really is a focus on rights as opposed to structure. And there are three other reasons. Um, younger countries, to countries that are, have gained independence relatively recently, tend to have, uh, as Brian was just saying, undeveloped common law systems. They were handed this common law system by Britain or a civil law system by France or whatever, um, but it hasn't yet matured. And so these countries are more susceptible to, they're sort of like a sponge. They want to uh, accumulate and learn new law. And so uh, they're more susceptible to the sorts of rights that the international community would like to, to have them adopt. So that's transnational, and that explains why countries so readily adopt these foreign and international models. Why doesn't the same thing happen with structural provisions? And here I, I emphasize a, a phenomenon called self-dealing. It turns out the converse is true. There are many benefits and very few costs to the drafters self-dealing, if that's what they want. Um, first of all, as I said, this focus on rights as opposed to structure. It's not just with foreign consultants, but it's also with international instruments, treaties the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights and other uh, UN treaties tend to deal with uh, rights. What sort of rights should a country adopt? They don't deal with the types of government structures that countries should have. And it turns out that then that leads drafters to sort of tweak their constitutions in a way that allows them to self-deal power uh, to themselves and their political allies uh, that will benefit them after adoption. And I've sort of looked at South Sudan as what I call Exhibit A for this intermestic constitution. Uh, as I'll show in a second, South Sudan has very much a transnational constitutional, a uh, transnational bill of rights, but a sort of domestic self-dealt structure in its constitution. How do we know this? Well, we can look at what happened on the ground um, I, I don't know how much you've, you know about South Sudan, but in 2005, there was a comprehensive peace agreement signed between the Republic of Sudan and uh, what was then Southern Sudan, part of Sudan that ended the decades long civil war. And that also formed sort of a template for the both countries later constitutions. And the rights that were in that CPA were literally cut and pasted from existing agreements, existing uh, international treaties that both parties were, were members of. 
We also see these groups coming in that I referred to in 2005 and helping southern Sudan then. Southern Sudan write its semi-autonomous uh, regional constitution. And then in 2011, when South Sudan uh, became an independent state, uh, we have groups coming in and impressing their views of what sort of rights they should have. So let's look at some empirical analysis. Other scholars have taken all of the world's constitutions and attempted to quantify them, to put them into a series of codes, which uh, admittedly is an imperfect uh, way to describe a constitution, but it's also a handy way to sort of get the big picture of what constitutions cover. So we can compare the, the rights that any two constitutions have, or we can compare constitutions with other documents, such as treaties, which also have rights. Turns out South Sudan's constitutional rights provisions are highly similar there at the top to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, also highly similar to the European Convention on Human Rights. This is a, a map showing the similarity of South Sudan to the rest of the world. You can see that the black part there is actually Sudan. This is before the, it was divided, but of course, uh, both Sudan and South Sudan would be the, the highest level of correlation. It turns out South Sudan, with just a few exceptions, is almost a carbon copy of Sudan's constitution, which, and when you think of it, in one way is not surprising because it's its parent of sort. They have a common origin. In another way, it is surprising because these countries fought a uh, two decades civil war over some of these same values. Um, it was, of course, many, or many causes of the war, including resources and tribalism and so forth. But, um, but one of them was differences of religion and other ideologies and language and so forth. So the greatest, uh, the greatest correlation there tends to be in sub-Saharan Africa and the countries right around South Sudan. And if we look at the development over time since after World War II, this shows the resemblance of the 2011 South Sudan Constitution to the rest of the world. Now, obviously, South Sudan wasn't around in 1946, but this kind of assumes that it, it had been. And if it had been around there in 1950, we would see that it would have almost no resemblance to uh, the, either the rest of the world or sub-Saharan Africa. Whereas in 2010, and actually, uh, that's 2011. Is that just sub-Saharan Africa and the world? Yeah, so, yeah, sorry. So the, this may be a bit small. The world is the red line, the red um, dotted line, and the blue line is the solid, that's sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so it's similar to both. It's a highly similar document. If you were to pick out a random constitution in the world, chances are it would have many of the same rights as South Sudan. If you were to pick out a random one from sub-Saharan Africa, chances are even higher. It would look very similar. All right, so what we conclude from all this, substantively, the South Sudan Constitution has, it looks a lot like uh, many other constitutions. It doesn't seem to be a domestic product. Its rights provisions look like a lot of other constitutions. What about the structural provisions? Well, it turns out that we do see self-dealing in the structural provisions, but not in the rights provisions. Just very quickly, we, in 2011, uh, the Constitution was rewritten by a technical committee. This was dominated by President Kiir's Sudan People's, Sudanese People's Liberation Movement. And it actually made a number of tweaks to the Constitution that sort of flew under the radar, but did enormous work for the SPLM and President Kiir in helping him to what would ultimately allow him to undermine the robust egalitarian rights provisions in the Constitution. So as I talked to one person, they added a second legislative chamber. Why? Because all of the Sudanese legislat legislators needed, they were out of work. They couldn't serve in the Sudan uh, legislator, legislature anymore, so they needed to f uh, find jobs for all the out of work legislators. It also undermined federalism. It concentrated power in and around Juba, the capital, eliminated all courts and judges at the state level, and it turns out that support for the SPLM, the dominant party, is strongest there uh, around the capital. It also gives the president extraordinary emergency powers. The president under the Constitution 
uh, can suspend most of the Bill of Rights if he declares an emergency. And the criteria for an emergency is what you'd expect, sort of a, an invasion, but also an economic threat to any part of the country. So if President Keir finds some sort of economic danger to any small part of the country, he can invoke the emergency powers, suspend the entire Bill of Rights. It also allows him to dissolve the national legislature. Now, the national legislature gets to ratify that after so many days, but if they've been dissolved, they probably won't be able to do that. Finally, it gives the president the power to dismiss uh, national judges and justices if he deems them incompetent. And you know, we can imagine that our president in the United States and past presidents may uh, often think that the Supreme Court or other judges are incompetent when they rule against them. Um, if that were the case here, he could dismiss them for, for incompetence. So all of these things were self-doubt. They greatly, greatly aided the dominant SPLM uh, ruling party uh, during the 2011 transitional process. And yet we have this robust Bill of Rights still that you know, is very amenable to the international community. So would this happen in South Sudan? Where else does it happen? We suspect it's not limited just to South Sudan. And it appears there are four factors here that will predict whether a constitution has this intermestic model. First, the country is young. It's strategically important to the international community for some reason. The government has a history of failing to fulfill constitutional promises. And one party dominates domestic politics. And it turns out that many of these are true for much of Sub-Saharan Africa, including East Africa. Not all countries and not all of the factors, but many of them. So let's look at which. Country is young. So among East Africa, the mean, the, the median founding was in 1968. That's not surprising. Um, many of East Africa, many of the East African countries gained independence in the early 60s from Great Britain and from other countries, Belgium and France. Countries that are strategically important to the international community. I mean, all countries are, 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 uh, are important to the international community to different degrees, but we can think of particular ones like South Sudan, like Uganda, uh, Somalia, Zimbabwe, either because they have resources like oil, uh, because there's concern about uh, terrorism, as there was with uh, Sudan, and, um, and funding and supporting terrorism. Uh, because of allegations of genocide and so forth. And the government has a history of failure to fulfill constitutional promises. Last year, uh, two law professors, uh, Mila Verstig and David Law at UVA and Wash U, published a paper called Sham Constitutions, where among other things, they rated the, the shaminess, if you will, of every constitution since World War II. And I looked at that data, and I actually coded South Sudan myself because they hadn't, hadn't yet uh, had any data for it. The sham index uh, is 0.39 for East Africa, the lower, the worse, the shamier, uh, versus 0.62, which is the world average in 2012. Uh, so that's a, definitely a significant difference. So there's a larger gap in East Africa between promises made in the Constitution and actually fulfilling those promises. And one party dominates domestic politics. Uh, we have that certainly in South Sudan, in Eritrea. Uh, probably half of the people in this room know more about Uganda than I do, but my understanding is that until 2005, there was sort of a de facto effective restriction on other parties um, under Museveni. And now that's been loosened a bit, but someone else will correct me. Um, so we ha do have a one party dominating domestic politics in some of these countries. So uh, what does that suggest? Um, for these countries that have these factors, it creates sort of a perfect storm that allows this intermestic constitution to develop. Robust rights that appease the domestic, uh, that appease both domestic constituents and the international community, and at the same time, self-dealt structural provisions that give leaders the lawful authority to undermine those robust rights. And so all of these um, 
initiatives by the international community to promote rights uh, may be in vain if they're undermined by these structural provisions. So to conclude, what are the normative implications? The factors I just talked about, being young and having a history of not fulfilling promises and so forth, um, there's very little either citizens of a country or the international community can do about that. But it seems that this, this singular focus on rights and sort of a neglect of structure may be contributing to the problem. So perhaps uh, both drafters of, of treaties, such as the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, and foreign consultants who go into a country may consider putting more emphasis on basic uh, parts of structure. For example, encouraging parliamentary systems instead of presidential ones to sort of spread the wealth. Naming and shaming countries with institutions that have autocratic features. And perhaps more promotion and more reward for both vertical and horizontal uh, separation of powers. Vertical, of course, meaning federalism, separating power, giving states and provinces more say in government. Uh, thus re reflecting the uh, ideological, cultural, and ethnic diversity of the country, and horizontal, uh, separating power between a president or a prime minister and a legislature and an independent judiciary. And uh, I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Kevin. I have the, uh, the pleasure of teaching uh, constitutional law here in the School of Government, and uh, we take so much for granted, uh, our founders. And so it's interesting to, uh, to hear basically the founding period through, uh, through much of the young uh, governments in, in East Africa and seeing very significant problems that were faced uh, by, uh, by our founders many centuries ago. Interesting. Very, very much so. Appreciate it. Third speaker this morning is um, Edward Sigabanjo Cato. Edward is a fellow brother in Christ. He is a president of the Uganda Christian Lawyers Fraternity and also a board member of certain um, charities that, uh, that we are very familiar with here. He's, uh, he's a board member of Habitat of Uganda as well as Navigators, New Uganda. He's also a member of Advocates International, as well as the African Christian Lawyers Fellowship. During his spare time, when well, he's not doing all this stuff, Edward is the managing partner of Sigabanjo and, and Company Advocates, where he has successfully represented and advised both local as well as international corporation in areas such as commercial law, banking, and property conveyances, all of which have to be fairly challenging uh, given the barriers that we've heard so far. Edward is an honors graduate of uh, Makiari uh, University, and received his postgraduate diploma in legal practice at the Law Development Center in 1991. He's over 15 years of legal practice at the bar in Uganda. And I'm looking forward to a, a very special um, practical discussion about uh, about justice in Uganda, particularly in light of these barriers that, that, that we've seen. And so therefore, looking forward to to uh, Edward's presentation on, on overcoming these barriers and how ha he's been able to do that in a very practical way. So let's represent, uh, let's welcome him. I forget the time, whether it is morning or... <laughs> no, it's morning. It's still morning. <laughs> okay, yeah. good. Uh, oh, it's 7 o'clock in the morning. We, 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 have, the <laughs> we, we haven't had lunch yet, so we're still on. Okay, good. Oh, wait, no, it's 3 in the morning. Sorry, it's 3 in the morning. 2 in the morning. Good. <laughs> 3 in the morning. Good. 3 in the morning. Good. Yeah, um, yeah like the previous speaker, or oh, unfortunately, like the previous speaker, I'm one who is getting accustomed to wearing glasses. So I don't know when to carry them. 
and when not to carry them. And on this trip, I forgot them. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to overload uh, this. Uh, but let me start with two stories. Uh, one is having graduated um, in 1990 uh, in Kampala. I could not find a job for one year. And then eventually I found a job in the Ministry of Justice. I wanted to do civil litigation, but they sent me to the Department of uh, Public Prosecutions. And I, there I was assigned three files, which I finished uh, in one day and read them catholically like somebody from law school. In other words, you don't read the end, you start from the top, only to reach the end and realize that this person is in a prison 300 kilometers away from Kampala, where the uh, Department of Justice is. And three years ago, somebody read that file and determined that there was not enough evidence. This man should be released or some more investigations needed to be done and came to the same conclusion. But the file has come back to you <laughs> to read the same, fi the same facts. Nothing was done and you make the same recommendation and the file goes back. It took me three months to see my supervisor. Uh, I would go in and either he's having a cup of tea, talking to a colleague, and he says, come in on Tuesday at 10. At 10, he's just coming in. Now, when you consider that that person is now a judge of the Court of Appeal, <laughs> then you know the challenges that we have. Today is a judge of the Court of Appeal. It took me three months to discuss three files with him about these cases. And I went to the department and I said, can I get more files? And they said, no, until your supervisor says you can get more files. So for three months, I handled three files, which I finished in one day. So I wrote my resignation and uh, left the department. Of course, it is much better now <laughs> since, <laughs> since, since, since uh, even long before Mike uh, came in. But that's, uh, that's, that tells uh, a bit of the story. Probably one of the pictures I thought about and left out today, I'm going to show you some pictures, is one when we went to Guru in 2008. I led a, a group of Christian lawyers about uh, three, three girls from the office and myself, my wife, and yeah, we had three children at that time. One boy, two girls. The one girl was on clutches. She had broken her leg but she insisted she wanted to come. We went to Guru. This is a place where there has been the Kony and the invisible children. The war is just ended and uh, people are trying to get back to normal life, but they are still in the camps. And we went up there as Christian lawyers to see what we could do. And we reached those camps and you could see these children with wounds on their legs that had been caused by flies because they don't bathe, they're dirty. The flies come and lay eggs on their legs and then they become a wounds and then septic. And we realized that as Christian lawyers, yes, we, there were things about children's rights, but you could not talk about them. The real th what was needed here was medical help. So go back to Kampala and see what can you do and work with other Christian organizations to 
bring this medical help and that the law uh, would not help at that stage. And so maybe that's a challenge of where Christian, rather, where East African countries are. That is the picture of East Africa. Uh, and of course, if you think about, I mean, the, the purple area is about so, uh, Somalia, and then above Uganda is Sudan, and then west of Uganda is Congo. I mean, those are all regions that are in conflict right now. Leave alone that Uganda, Kenya, Kenya has been stable. It's all we thought until 2008 when it exploded. But things seem to have come back. Rwanda, Burundi, the same. But some of the things that we've just had here are, are basically true of East Africa. You have the high court siege in Kampala. What is happening uh, there is that uh, the high court had granted bail to some treason suspects. And a group of armed uh, soldiers, they even dressed in black, so they were called the Black Mambas, uh, decided to take over the court and rearrest these individuals. And uh, as we shall see, uh, we, we talk about the Historian Court of Justice. That is an evolving process. But you can certainly see uh, the rule of law. That is a lawyer arrested while serving a court order to stop the impeachment of the Lord Mayor. In other words, um, there was a process to impeach the mayor of Kampala. And he went to court and filed an application to stay his impeachment. And the court granted an interim order, which this lawyer is supposed to have brought to the city council to serve. But they were prepared for him. And uh, in the end, I mean, there was pictures than that. But when you think that that's the lawyer, uh, then you know uh, the status of things. That is the post-election violence in Kenya. Everybody knows what happened. Uh, people with machetes, sticks, and uh, lots of lives lost. Now, what um, we have discussed the nature of barriers in terms of uh, Uganda. We have looked at them generally. And then when you look at East Africa, not very different. He just mentioned that uh, most countries are characterized by systems of government based on one party rule or political systems where one party is dominant or was dominant for a long time with or without elections. If you take the Ugandan government, it's been in power for 26 plus years. And uh, that's the first government that you would say is stable. And uh, from the last resolution, uh, President Museveni is supposed to run for another term of office. So political party origins are based on ethnic and tribal and religious uh, roots. Uh, if you go to Kenya, you have the Luo and you have the Kikuyu. You even had football teams based on tribal uh, uh, backgrounds and big fights whenever those two teams uh, met. You know, you have poor electoral processes leading to lack of confidence in the result. In Uganda, we have never had a concession you know, even to the point of where you have Bush versus Goa. So you don't have that. Number four, that you lack uh, or you have the existence of a weak opposition. So the executive controls all. 
any legislation can be passed, including you know, amendment of the constitution. Kenya has done better with a better constitution, but still there are impediments there. You know, the, the executive controls who heads the electoral commission. It will control who becomes a judge. So you have all those uh, things uh, lining up there. Then, as we have seen, you have the lack of respect of judicial decisions. Some will be obeyed, some will not be. You know, it, it depends on which one. Well, having uh, listened to what we have gone through, I don't think that even these solutions here really come naturally. And I think that that's why probably the most important of what I'm going to say today is probably in the last part of what what can a local attorney do and what can you do to support local attorneys in bringing about uh, this uh, change? Well, strengthen political parties so that they can become issue-based, politi uh, the politics can become issue-based away from tribal lines. That is, that's a challenge. And I think that that takes many steps. It is not, you don't wake up and, and start issues. You know, when you look at the newspapers, when you look at the, the when you look at the, the yeah, the Wall Street Journal, <laughs> all the Financial Times here, you see newspapers that are trying to put forward an ideology. Whether it's about uh, government, whether it's about the process in which uh, education is being uh, governed. When you see our newspapers, when you see uh, the issues that are coming out on the news. Um, it is just, it's just there. That will not be a debate. Maybe it will be a debate in one day and it will be gone off the news. And it's very easy for the government to tell you, oh, if you're not uh, happy about it, go to court. So in other words, the people, you, you can talk about it, but you really don't make any, any difference. I want to say that this has connection with the, both the economic and social empowerment. We think that you know the government can't do anything because it's going to pay the MPs or buy off the opposition. It happened in the 1980s. It happened under in Kenya under the Moi government, you know. And even today we think they are political settlements where some members can easily cross from one party to another. Increase civic education. The majority of educated people in Uganda neither register nor vote due to apathy. He talked about it. They, we think nothing is going to change. I think that the argument is that educated Christians must take the lead. When I tell that to my wife, she says, uh-uh, you're not starting to go to politics. <laughs> I wish, you know, I, I showed you the most vocal MP, a lady who became an MP, you know? I mean, when you look at her, you don't think that she has much substance. But when that lady starts talking, you know, the government will rise up. But she doesn't look like she has much. Those who are educated, those who are lawyers and have the voice, are in making money and back in their office. They don't want to bother the government, you know. So that's the challenge that has, when you understand as to what needs to be overcome, that Christians who are educated, who are in position, need to realize that it is their role to fight for those who are poor 
and who are marginalized. And I think that's where we need to start thinking and how can we help the church and the Christians into uh, making that move. Well, when you come to the political integration, we have the East African community that has come up and now you have the East African Court of Justice. But all those are modeled again, I mean, as, as uh, the previous speaker has said, you know, we are trying to conceptualize things from the West and then bring them down. Yes, they are going to work to some extent. Um, you know, the case I've talked about there, Katavazi, is the case that arose out of the court siege. In essence, these people went to the Constitutional Court, the Law Society petitioned the um, Constitutional Court that the siege was unlawful, unconstitutional, and that these people could not be retried in a military court. So they have a process going on, treason charges are still going on, but they are also rearrested and sent back to, to a military court and uh, f for second, charges. So at the same time, they are facing charges under two, two, two processes. And uh, so basically the court restated uh, the rule of law. So that can be one drive. Of course, economic, uh, rather economic union and political union that we are going for um, has its own challenges, but it is probably bringing more accountability. But again, it's trying to enforce something from the top. You have fundamental, I mean, social and economic barriers, as we talked about. How many have the resources to go to the East African Court of Justice? Or even file a case in Ugandan courts? The geographic location of the courts and the operation. Lack of adequate representation. I said, laws are written in English, and yet ignorance of the law is no defense. You know, as a young lawyer, I mean, I remember going to a, a court um, in the West, about 300 kilometers. And while I was waiting for my case, one case came up of a, a herdsman found with a, in possession of a firearm. So they read him the charge. And he said, uh, do you uh, 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 accept the charge? So somebody is translating. And somebody that sometimes that translation is not exact. So he says, yes, I admit the charge. So plead guilty. Plea of guilty entered. And then um, sentencing. They ask him what he had to say. And he said, look, I was just looking after the cattle. And I came upon this gun, and I picked it up. Of course, an illegal mind would know that he has changed his plea. That's not what the court followed. The court took that and still went ahead and sentenced him. So, no, and you can be sure there's no appeal, um, nobody to look over that sentence. By the time they come to the file, maybe five years have passed. So you have to contend with the fact that majority are poor with no access to education, no access to a lawyer, so they have no knowledge of even the legal rights. Uganda Christian lawyers started an office in the north. We have had to close that office because there was basically no work. The donors and the supporters, the people who support uh, some of these projects, wanted us to move elsewhere where there was more work. The problem, the magistrate did not come, so there was always no work in the court. And in that region, the, this, this, the cases are settled at the police. That means money. So it's a kind of a, a sort of a plea bargain, <laughs> you know, <laughs> unwritten plea bargain, you know, even rape, defilement, all of those, you know. 
And who takes the money? As long as the father gets enough, the victim is forgotten. Well, what we could we do? We as a board recommended that that complaint be raised with the inspector of courts. You know, others, as he mentioned, traditional practices, I mean, all over East Africa, customary marriages, child marriages, witchcraft, child sacrifice, traditional religious beliefs, practices like, you know, widow inheritance, I mean, are still prevalent. How do you bring these principles of rule of law, you know, and, and put them in there? When he talked about corruption, I mean, that's a big one. I think what I see, what has happened, is because I can be in Uganda and, and, and send a WhatsApp message. In other words, the smartphones are there before all these other processes. They have jumped all these other processes. And now, I mean, you have this team of experts, I mean, coming and bringing the rest of, I mean, the jurisprudence and even um, uh, the teaching and expect that things are just going to flow. Uganda Christian lawyers, I think we have a small, I mean, part of the answer in the things that I have seen. That as an association, we can drive a few things, and I think this is what I have said. The core activities, legal aid, legal education, criminal public defense, juvenile justice. You know, I put here a case of a 16-year-old girl in, in, in a court in Kampala with 20 others. I had gone to a session uh, on a different case, and I was made to sit and wait for the magistrate in a court um, that had other juveniles. My case was not about juveniles, but I sat next to this girl. Talking to her, she sounded, um, I mean, she, she, she was intelligent. So I asked her, what's your case? She said, oh, my, first of all, I was gotten from the village and brought here as a house help. So these are domestic servants. So people go to the village and recruit children as domestic servant. It's common. And uh, there's, there's a, there are laws against child employment, but largely un, unnoticed. And the employer thought she had stolen a million shillings. So I went to the police and reported her and she was sent um, to, uh, uh, to a child remand home. And these people are coming from the child remand home, coming to this court where there are adult um, criminals. I looked at the rest, 16, 18 year olds, about 15 of them, all theft charges. So that's a social problem, first of all. Why are they involved in? theft. Uh, but for this girl, how could I help her? And the challenges of time that people talked about moving from even just going to find uh, where, I mean, to go to the remand home, all those things are big challenges. I assigned one of my assistants and said, look, can you follow up this case? And she did not. The next time I found out from the child, uh, from the home, at least this girl had been uh, sent away. But it's just like, how can I make a difference in this one life if it meant anything? So there you are, UCLF in the 2012-2013 report, you know, conducted legal education over, you know, 1,914 uh, beneficiaries. These included 968 community members, 254, those are local councils, local council leaders. They have made copies of, you know, 
of pastors and community leaders writes manual, updated them, printed them, translated them, and then distributed them. So those are small initiatives that if they can be done with this group that I know has no resources on, you know, on a shoestring budget, that if we made those interventions and even the governments were encouraged to take up such that those will make, eventually they will make the big difference and we can make the big leap. Certainly that calls uh, for a different action and sometimes it doesn't look as the obvious. But I want to think that even Kenya has such a project uh, established and uh, supported by the uh, Christian Legal Society as well as the London uh, Lawyers Fellowship, that those small interventions that will start to change the wheels. Of course, we take great pride in people like Justice Mike because we know that, I mean, we can trust the Department of Public Prosecutions. We can trust him as a judge. It makes a big, big difference. And yes, we have said yes that when the time comes, maybe some of us may have to sacrifice our nice cars and good things and go in for the sake of making that uh, progress. Thank you very much. Thank you, Edward. Our last speaker was uh, to be a uh, representative from the State Department, uh, but uh, that uh, person had to cancel. Uh, so therefore, we have our, our own uh, Michelle Hughes coming back for round two. Uh, Michelle is going to uh, uh, hopefully comment upon various things, things that uh, hopefully she, uh, she learned and uh, some additional observations concerning uh, the rule of law in East Africa. So Michelle, would you like to sit down and, and do that or would you like to come up here? Your choice. You, so you can say, Steve, by the way, after this. Is this on? Yeah. It perfect. is. Uh, after this, uh, we're going to have some students uh, with microphones right <laughs> over here uh, seeking questions from the audience. So be thinking of questions uh, so that we can uh, pepper the, uh, the speakers with before lunch. Thanks. Okay. What I was asked to do was to react uh, to the panel. Um, so my initial reaction is I'm really honored to be sitting here at the table with you guys. That was, that was awesome. Um, and there were some things that you said that really, really struck home with me and that I wanted to expound on a little bit. Um, and first of all, I was really quite taken with the presentation on constitutions because this is a pretty controversial area in the rule of law development field. And as Kevin said, you know, there are different schools of thoughts about how constitutions should be developed. But quite frankly, nobody ever steps back and questions whether or not we should be writing a new constitution at all when we go into some of these countries that are in transition. And um, I was really struck by the similarity index and the degree of change, um, of constitutional change over a 70 year period of time. And I'm not sure I was reading that graph correctly, but you know, I, I look at this nice, fairly even line of rest of world constitutions, and then I have constitutional content, and then I see this line that starts like way down here for sub-Saharan Africa and goes way up here in a in less than a 70 year period of time. And I'm thinking, wow, what political system can handle that degree of change? I, I mean, it's pretty extraordinary when you, when you look at it that way. But I think constitutions, and my experience is, is that constitutions can be extremely powerful tools. When I was in Afghanistan, uh, I used to carry around in my backpack all the time big stacks of the Afghan constitution translated into Dari and Pashto. And the Afghan constitution was largely written uh, by international donors and principally the United States and the UK uh, with a little bit of help from our EU partners. 
but the Afghans did have a big role to play in it. And it's kind of interesting that you talked about Max Planck Institute, because one of the criticisms of the Afghan um, constitution was that it was too tactical. It was too tr low level. It was too much about um, process and how many judges could you have and exactly what was the appointment process for them. And what were the roles and responsibilities of the police force? And, and it was very low level, and I would hear my EU counterparts say, that's not a constitution. Constitutions are statements of principles and statements of rights. But I will tell you that for all the criticism that this constitution came under and continues to come under, as I would travel around the country, those pocket constitutions in Dari and Pashtu were a hot commodity. And my ticket to pretty much any venue or forum I wanted to get into. I would go into places, into districts and villages where the literacy rate was probably around 10%. And I would hand out a couple of those constitutions to maybe a member of the local um, elders council or the local community council at the district level, and I would come back a few months later and discover that those same constitutions had been passed around from member to member to member. And the lone scribe in the bazaar who was literate, who was doing all of the writing for everyone in that particular village or district, um, had been asked uh, individually to come in and read this constitution to these leaders who had it. And um, they were very, very proud of the fact that they had a constitution. It meant something to them. Police officers carried it in their pockets. And one of the things that really struck me when I was down in um, a particular district in the south of Afghanistan that had been hotly contested, um, there was a, an international aid and development specialist there who had been working governance for two years. And one of the things that he instituted that was just owned by the local judges, the police chief, and the Hukuk, who is a Ministry of Justice uh, appointed mediator, um, which is really kind of like a sheriff and a, and a government sanctioned you know, mediator, for, for want of a better term. Um, was that every single week they would meet in what we sort of joked was a dinner theater. And they would choose a provision of the Constitution or a provision of the criminal code and assign a police officer to work with the prosecutor to act this thing out. And so you'd have the local police force, you'd have the judge, you'd have the chief prosecutor, and you would have the hukuk, and they would all be in a room, and the police officers would act out the crime, or they would act out the dispute, and then they would have a big discussion as to what should the police officer have done with that dispute. If it was a dispute between two mother-in-laws over the misconduct of a daughter-in-law, for example, where was that dispute supposed to go? Should that have gone to the hook? Should that have gone to the police chief? Should that have gone to the prosecutor? And, and there would be vigorous, vigorous debate, and then the judge would talk about what he wanted to see if that thing came into his courtroom. This is a very rudimentary place. I mean, the, the infrastructure is like of biblical proportions, not in a good way. And Yet this was going on, and it was backed up by the power of these little pocket constitutions and the discussion that we are a nation with a constitution and a set of laws and a set of rights and procedures. And for better or for worse, it provided an effective starting point for reinstituting some degree of common understanding of the rule of law across a very diverse tribal, ethnic, and religious la and political landscape. So I'm, I'm really taken by this, and I would offer a recommendation that studying, that furthering this study of constitutional development in developing countries and in transitioning countries, and looking at what works and what doesn't work over an extended period of time as change management occurs, is probably a really important field of study. And, and I'm really quite, quite seized by that.
Um, and that kind of leads me into the second thing that I wanted to comment on, and um, Edward, this was really yours, and that's the important of edu importance of education when we are developing the rule of law. I was asked a couple of years ago the question of what did I think was the single most important area to engage in in trying to restore and strengthen the rule of law. And I really had to think hard of that. You know, I'm like, only one? Really? Um, and I stepped you know, I thought about it, and I thought it has to be education, civic education at every single level. We take that so for granted in our country, but creating an understanding throughout the population at every level and communicating it in a way in which it is understood through dinner theaters, through oral communications, through radio, um, through pictorial depictions, through poetry recitations. Um, all of these things using traditional mechanisms that are used for communication and dialogue and discussion to educate the population about their legal system, their rights and their responsibilities and those of the government is probably, I, I really honestly believe, the single most important thing that we can do. And it's more than just public, public or, um, published materials. Um, because I think we do have to recognize the power of oral tradition and the challenge of illiteracy. Uh, but this is a way, this is a low cost, high dividend area of development for rule of law. And what's more, and now this takes me into the third thing I wanted to talk about, which was the problem of corruption. What's more is it creates an external accountability mechanism that cannot be matched. Because when you have people who believe, rightly or wrongly, some in some cases, that they are educated about the law and the obligations of their um, governing officials, then they begin to protest when they see those obligations not being carried out. They begin to look for certain things in the performance of public service. Um, and so this becomes the most the single most powerful accountability mechanism, just as in the example that I gave you when I was speaking earlier about the power from a security standpoint of getting the community vested in an oil pipeline, for example. Um, so I, I think this is a very big deal, and I really, um, I, I really want to compliment your efforts on that. And, and I hope that we give some more consideration as to how we can effectively advance education, not just as an education tool, but as an accountability mechanism to start combating some of the rampant corruption that we see. Um, a little more on corruption. I I've, have a lot of experience with it, unfortunately, including my own effort to bribe my luggage out of the customs hall in the airport in Ghana, um, two bucks got me in, found my, found my bags. Um, my unsuccessful effort to bribe the official at the National Archives in Afghanistan to let me take pictures of these gorgeous pa Persian miniature paintings by the masters of Herat, turns out that the curators are way uncorruptible because nothing that I offered um, got me those photos. Um, but corruption is a huge problem, and there's a, there isn't a lot of scholarship out there on what works. There's a whole lot of scholarship on what doesn't, and people are really willing to throw stones at development programs and say, well, that's not addressing the corruption problem effectively. So I want to lay out for you um, what does work? How do you overcome the barriers of corruption from a very macro standpoint and then, you know, let you think about how you drop that down. When we are building rule of law capacity or governance capacity, you have to think of it in three ways. You're building an institution, you're building operating forces, if you will, courts, cops, judges, prosecutors, defense attorneys, prisons, um, and you're trying to build a culture of accountability and public service. And these things have to be addressed. There are, there are like different lines of effort to address these. Number one is when we're looking at this institutional element, it's inoculating the system right from the get-go. And this is where things like building in bureaucratic processes that take decision-making authority away from one guy 
um, can be very helpful. So when looking at legal reform or amending laws or amending rules and regulations, you kind of want to build in these checks and balances, which make, if, make the systems wildly less efficient, but way more accountable. And, and this is very critical. Um, and, you know, just a, sort of a, an example of this at a very, very low level is in Liberia. The court reporters there all use manual typewriters, and they sit there and they type out a, trans, a transcript of every trial as it goes on, and this is very inefficient. And um, U.S. and UNMIL both wanted to give them some kind of automated transcription capability in their courts. And the defense bar was the first one that pushed back against this, but also so did um, some of the victims witness associations that were being, were being established at that time. And the reason was because the people felt and the perception was that if you have someone sitting there with a manual typewriter and carbon paper, that is a transcript that cannot be changed. Whereas if you put it into a computer, it can be changed, it can be altered, it can be sent around to places where people don't want it to go. And furthermore, a lot of the folks, a lot of the litigants that are in the system don't really have a good understanding of how the computer system works anyway, and it's a very mysterious thing. And so it kind of, it actually reduces the credibility and the legitimacy of the trials. And it introduces in an opportunity for corruption. Um, so by keeping in that manual typewriter requirement, with carbon paper copies being issued at the end of each hearing, this actually becomes a way to inoculate the system um, and preserve some of the um, integrity of the files that go up on appeal. So this is just one example of it. Um, so number one, inoculating the system through bureaucratic processes. The second one is, is that you have to attack um, the mechanisms for enforcement of discipline and accountability within the institutions themselves. There do have to be codes of conduct within you know, all of the rule of law institutions, but they have to be enforceable. And those enforcement mechanisms have to be reasonable. And a lot of what you see in the development contact text is you'll see people wanting to prosecute everybody, particularly at a high level, for corruption. Just not realistic. That is not enforceable. I'm sorry. For a lot of reasons, even when there's political will to do it, there is political cost when you go in and you prosecute someone because that person always had political backers. They had people who appointed them, who supported them, who mentored them, who furthered their careers. You go in and you take that person out. When you're dealing with a, an area where relationships are king, you have now undercut the credibility of some of the very people who brought those individuals up through the system. And we don't think about that very often. But on the other hand, creating administrative mechanisms um, for enforcement of discipline, code of conduct, and, and creating opportunities for rehabilitation within those systems becomes very, very important. And this is hard to build. Um, and quite honestly, um, you know, looking at how security forces do um, discipline and enforcement in Western countries is probably a better model than some of the ethics, you know, ethical models that we use um, because the security force systems tend to be a little more set piece and they tell you what you can do. And there's not a lot of room for interpretation, particularly in Western systems, whereas more touchy-feely things like ethical codes get very difficult to interpret and very difficult to enforce consistently across a nascent institution. Um, and then finally, inculcating this culture of accountability in public service is so important. It starts at the beginning. It starts with how people are vetted before they go into law schools, how people are vetted before they become police, the degree to which public participation is allowed. Um, I have seen some gold standi standard vetting programs in post-conflict countries where nobody got into a 
judgeship or a law school or a police force without the entire community from which they come being offered the opportunity through a public forum to comment on this individual's fitness for the field that they were trying to go into. And it sounds like a lot of work, and it is. But it also means that when that person comes out, they are representing the community. And they're representing a standard, and they're being held to a standard. And the elders in that community now have a stake in the success and the performance of that individual and their function. And from that point forward, of course, every single step of the way has to follow um, this idea that you're constantly trying to inculcate a culture of accountability and public service both inside the institution and also from the outside, working with the media to educate the media to be able to report responsibly on rule of law issues, and again, going back to educating the community and individuals on what their rights and responsibilities and what appropriate government roles and responsibilities are. Um, I guess the last thing I just want to comment on, because I didn't earlier, and I probably ought to, because um, I know it's on a lot of people's minds, and that's the problem of human rights, and particularly the problem of gender rights. And I have a real hard time with this. You know, you heard some of my bio earlier from um, Professor Stern before I spoke. And, you know, clearly in our own country, I have always been someone who has pushed the boundaries in terms of the roles of women. I find it, I find that the longer that I am in the rule of law development business, the more cautious and more conservative I have become about gender issues. Um, I really, really agree with what Cynthia talked about this morning in her Albania example on um, human trafficking, that when you look at the law, when you really dig into the law of a country, you generally find that everything you need in order to enforce gender rights probably sits in that law somewhere. But it's not being enforced or there's not a good process or procedure um, or people aren't educated enough about it or it hasn't become a compelling issue for them. Um, and I would say on gender issues, it's really important to try to mainstream these not as gender issues, not as women's rights or women's protection or women's as women as victims, but stepping back and looking at the traditional roles that women do play in society that they're respected for. Dispute resolution um, mediators, for instance, for family disputes or domestic disputes within the community. The roles they play in early childhood education that they're respected for. The roles they play as leaders within the family families, as leaders within the agricultural context, as caretakers for um, crops and for um, animals. And you have to pick these things out and get very opportunistic about it and look at it more from a perspective of how do we reinforce their strengths and then use existing law to protect their ability to perform these traditional roles. And honestly, in my opinion and in my experience, until you start to take that kind of positive approach to it, um, you really don't have a foundation to build on that's going to be accepted or broadly accepted to start working on these more difficult issues um, that are very gender specific. Um, and I may be in the minority on this, and, and, and I hope I don't offend anyone on this. Um, but I really do believe that we have to be very careful. Um, and also, we really do have to look at using women as protagonists and as producers of the rule of law rather than looking at them as victims of a rule of law system that is not functioning well. So thank you. Thank you, Michelle. <clears throat> All right, Ernie. You have some uh, students to uh, gather those microphones. I will start, and um, I guess I'll start with you, Brian, because uh, something you stated a long time ago, it seems, uh, kind of resonated with me. You were, were ta talking about um, traffic conditions and uh, things being a little chaotic, and I was just in uh, Delhi within the last couple of weeks, and, and uh, trust me, uh, traffic conditions are chaotic there also. As a matter of fact, um, of course, what does a tort lawyer do when he's in a new place? Of course, ask questions. And if you're seeing automobiles and, and, and motorcycles uh, uh, constituting eight lanes of traffic on a normally a three-lane traffic road, 
uh, you think that there's probably going to be a lot of accidents in here, and there are a lot of accidents. So tour lawyer says, uh, fine, uh, 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 is there a contingent fee agreement here? Uh, yeah, I also asked such questions, how long does it take to get to trial? And the, uh, the answer was uh, 20 years to get to trial. And you wonder, well, uh, the old saying that uh, justice delayed is justice denied is certainly true with respect to that. But the question that I, I have is, is focusing upon um, uh, what was said uh, this morning earlier, uh, that uh, there must be trust in a system, right? There must be legitimacy. And you're, you're, you're noting that there is a lack of trust, a lack of legitimacy uh, with respect to certainly the, uh, the motor vehicle laws uh, in Uganda. I, I experienced that same thing true in, in Delhi. Um, with, without this, this voluntarily following the law, it's going to be extraordinarily difficult to be able to establish a rule of law and then to establish economic prosperity. I mean, you noted if, if, if there is a lack of legitimacy uh, in the system, how can one really have a binding contract? Uh, those issues that we take for granted over here. Now, my question for, for anyone on the panel, has there been a model? You know, we, we lawyers love, uh, love precedent. Right. So has there been a model someplace that over time has developed from a from a, a lack of rule of law to a rule of law? And what have been the mechanisms that have have uh, generated that success? Courtney, you have a question? It's locked. Now I'm on. OK. E East Africa, the obvious answer is, is Rwanda. Um, when you cross the border from Uganda and Rwanda, to Rwanda, you just notice a level of rule following, but you don't know if that's based on fear, respect. Um, but they've definitely bought into collaborative effort a lot more, and they bought into it a lot quickly. And there's a strange irony in it, because all you ever hear in Africa, you hear Ubuntu, Ubuntu. You hear about this working together aspect, and yet that really applies to families and immediate people immediately around you and things like that. But um, in terms of life is going to be better if I follow the rules, the sort of Scandinavian approach, you know, something where you say this is this collective action is going to work. Yeah, I, there's a huge difference just across the border and the same people, you know, same people, really. I mean, the, the same tribe of people, essentially, on one side of the border and the other. And you see that government has been able to instill that however they did it it could be fear you know like, i don't i don't know but it but it there's there's a palpable difference hmm. yeah. all right anybody from the audience ah there's somebody way in the back hi i'm stockton brown thank you so much for coming my question is for professor dennison how does court under the mango trees work and who are the officers? Um, to what extent do the litigants in these courts buy in to the verdict and actually comply? And what types of disputes are resolved? Yeah, so the local council courts, they have a s limited jurisdiction officially, but just the same kind of things we're talking about with going up to the north and you know, your daughter's rape, so you get a goat, these kinds of things. So sometimes criminal cases can be handled there. It's like I said, the legal legitimacy of it has ended. So it's not really officially, until they fix the local councils st structurally, <laughs> their decisions aren't really binding. And of course you could appeal them anyway. There's all these levels of appeals. If you have money, you can just keep going and going and going and bury the person without money. So really, you, it's, it's almost mediation, but it's a more formalized form of mediation where you're paying. And the mango tree is all about shade. I mean, in Uganda, it's all about shade. The weather is perfect all day long as long as you're in the shade. If you're not in the shade from 9 to 5, it's pretty hot. So you've got to find a tree if you don't have a building. But you can imagine, you know, if you're, if you're having court under a tree, yeah, you, no one's keeping records. No, no one's, so when you file that appeal, it goes up to the next court, and there's nothing to show for it. And so you just do it de novo. You start all over again. But for a lot of people at the grassroots, it works for them because it's in their language. It's affordable. It's fast. And... And that's why they handle everything there. And they don't want, we'll talk about reconciliation tomorrow, but a lot of people don't want the guy down the street 
facing the death penalty because he's 18 and the girl is 14. Or, you know, they don't want that. So they'd rather get a goat uh, and, and just get, make it over. You get it over with. So you have these issues, and I know that, that, that Mike, I'm sure, can talk about these things as well, that, that Justice should be to the challenges they face in terms of you know, what gets prosecuted and what dis doesn't get prosecuted. Um, you have to make tough decisions sometimes, and sometimes the people are making it. Anyway, I think I have I mean, in a, lot, in a lot of instances, it can be more transparent, assuming everybody's around the table and under the tree and discussions are taking place. Um, but my question is for Kevin Cope, and, uh, and I was fascinated by your sham index. And I was wondering, if, if we were to take the sham index and, let's say, apply it to uh, the United States in 1830, what do you think the score would be? Great question. Uh, fortunately, or unfortunately, the data don't go back that far, so <laughs> I'd just be guessing. Um, so, so you'd have two, uh, there's been a trend, of course, since uh, 1700, uh, sorry, since about 1800 until now, throughout the world with an explosion of rights. Um, the, the US Constitution was one of the first um, to contain a, an explicit Bill of Rights, but it wasn't the only one. Um, and so now, um, the average, I think, average listed number of rights is something in the upper 20s. Um, it's a little bit more nuanced than that. Uh, whereas uh, around the, the beginning of the 19th century, uh, there were far fewer. So, uh, and I expect that under today's system, we would consider that the right to freedom of expression, especially under the, uh, the old Holmes doctrine and so forth, would not be protected in the United States. Um, uh, under today's standards, uh, perhaps cruel and unusual punishment uh, would not be delivered. Uh, some would argue that it still isn't with the death penalty. Um, so uh, as to whether it would be higher or lower than what we have in East Africa, um, I, I'd just be speculating, uh, but I, I suspect that it would be uh, substantially lower than it is today and substantially lower than, than most countries are today. So just the question of citizenship, we're talking about the United States before the Civil War, we're talking about the Civil Rights Movement, we're talking about uh, the enfranchisement of women, etc. And, and I'm, I'm specifically talking about 1830 because I'm just adding about 50 years to the period during which Uganda has been independent or many of the African countries. And so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that we can begin to put some of our discussions into historical context in order not necessarily to provide an apology for what's not happening, but at least perhaps to be much more critically analytical about what's going on. Uh, that's a great point. I, I would add that uh, obviously there were serious deficiencies in equal protection of citizens, uh, both with, with regard to women and with regard to African American slaves and, um, and others. Um, however, in 1830 we also didn't have an equal protection clause. We didn't have an explicit guarantee. So arguably, there was no promise to deliver. And that's, what, that's what's unique about the sham index. It doesn't purport to measure the actual delivery of human rights. We have constitutions in the sham index. And by the way, this isn't mine. This is uh, Mila Verstig and, and David Laws, so I don't take credit for it. It's a, a paper called Sham Constitutions, if you want to look it up. Uh, it's a pretty interesting read. Um, it, it doesn't look at the actual delivery of human rights in itself, but the, the gulf between delivery and promise. So there are countries like Saudi Arabia, which promise almost nothing. They're very honest in their constitution. You have very few rights, if any, and it turns out they deliver very few, if any, rights, and they have you know, a decent score. Uh, it may be even higher than, than the United States, the UK, and, uh, and perhaps Canada. The social, the social and economic rights that really drive the scores down, because they have all these aspirational social and economic rights that aren't being met. Right. Um, that's a great point. He said socio and economic rights, which the United States does not have, of course, um, are often 
primarily aspirational. In South Sudan, there's a right to free health care for everyone. So that, that's fantastic. And there's sort of a debate among whether the a debate among, among scholars and practitioners whether that's a good idea. Should we have these aspirational values, something to live, to, to think about and, and try to strive toward, or does this shamminess, does it undermine the credibility of the government when it fails to deliver so many things? If we don't deliver free health care, sorry. Or the rule of law. Yeah, does it undermine the rule of law? If we don't deliver free health care, we don't deliver housing, even though we promised it, what about when we promise not to torture? Does that also undermine that? our credibility on that thing, on that right. Very good. All right, who's next? Steven. Hello, I'm uh, Steve Christensen, a 1998 graduate of law school. Uh, was a practicing attorney and now I'm a uh, chaplain in our local jail. But from what I've heard so far today, it sounds like uh, uh, however we're going to advance the rule of law, uh, it has to be by working together and uh, by teamwork. Uh, the question I have is for Edward. I uh, really appreciated your presentation, and I'd like to ask, how can the church in East Africa best assist Christian lawyers to promote a more biblically oriented rule of law? Good question. <coughs> I think one, um, the first step is to help lawyers be able to identify, I mean, issues to deal with one rule of law and human rights. Today's law school teaches that. If you went back to the law school we went to, I mean, human rights was not a subject. Um, that's um, 10, yeah, 15, 20 years ago, human rights was not a subject. So basically, you had lawyers produced uh, for the commercial, you know, and, 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 and civil litigation. and. So one, one thing that we can do, and I, I've always argued, is that we need to help lawyers to be identified or to identify what is right and what is wrong, because then they can be able to teach it on to others. I hope I've answered the question. Who's next? My question sure. primarily for Brian, you talked about legal pluralism, and I guess the question is, can we have the rule of law in such legally pluralistic societies? And if not, what do we do about that? Because you know, we have these nations in East Africa, we have this great cultural heritage, and, and that's who these people are. They, they're, they're tribes, and they resolve their conflict through customary law, and, and it, it works for them. So should we, is it even proper for us to try to implement common law? In, in, do we need to do that? If so, again, how do, we, how do we do that? How does the rule of law function in such pluralistic societies? Yeah. I think the country that has done the best, made the best effort at trying to take that challenge on is, is South Africa. I mean, South Africa, and because I think they look at customary law the right way and that it changes and that people have, if there is a custom and it belongs to the people, the people have sovereignty over their own custom in a way and they have the right to change it and they're not stuck with the way it has existed forever. When you, when you give the people that power, then you have the ability to incorporate these other norms in a meaningful way instead of striking everything down. Because the customary law is not going away. And so in the current system in Uganda, you're just hoping that it slowly dies and just goes away, and maybe one day it will, but it's gonna be a long, slow, painful death. And for as long as that goes on, the people that are operating in that system are largely gonna be outside of the, the legal system where rights are actually enforceable. So I, I think what South Africa has done is, is very commendable, and I would like to see the courts in Kenya, Uganda, to take a revised approach at, at customary law to give it a chance to, to live in a legitimate way. Michelle. Yeah, I'm gonna say something about that, because I think that we're in a little bit of disagreement here on this. Um, I, I, I think that we have to be very cautious when we over-rely on the formal justice system as the answer. Um, the formal justice system is obviously very important. It creates a framework and boundaries. 
um, and creates continuity across the entire political spectrum within a, within a country or within a jurisdiction. Um, but at the end of the day, even here in our own country, the vast majority of disputes are resolved outside of the formal system. And how we reconcile that, and I think one of the strengths in our system is that we, we do recognize that and we create mechanisms and checks and balances for enforcement of some of those informal agreements. And I think about my time, um, you know, I practiced with a very high level law firm for nine years and I was doing complex litigation and criminal defense at a very high level um, for big clients paying top dollar and you wouldn't think that informal dispute resolution would come into play. But I can tell you that I settled multi-million dollar cases on things like giving a family season tickets to Bush Gardens. Um, and I almost never, ever, ever ended up in court in trial. Um, I carried a caseload of probably between 50 and 70 cases at any given time. I, I probably only tried in a nine-year period out of that caseload probably about two dozen cases actually to, to judgment. And when you, th when you think about that, um, those decisions, those plea bargains, those, um, those agreements, the, those settlements, they really occur outside of the scrutiny of the court, outside the scrutiny in some cases even of the litigants. You know, the discussions are going on back door between the lawyers. Um, and we trust that, we allow that in our system, but when we translate that down to transitioning societies, countries that are in a development state or in a transitional state or coming out of conflict or maybe have a greater reliance on informal systems, we're not very good at extrapolating what we're doing here and what we're very comfortable with down to um, what maybe we perceive as a, a less educated or a less accountable set of processes. But in reality, when you start getting on the ground and you're using these processes in the mango courts or whatever you want to call them, it's no different than what we're doing at a very high level here. And I say that, and I say that with authority, um, because I have seen the dispute resolution that happens at every single level, both in our country and in developing countries. So I think that we have to be really careful about how we address taking away informal, sis, informal dispute resolution mechanisms and how we view them. Um, to me, the real challenge is ensuring that fundamental rights uh, as laid out in the Constitution and as, as agreed upon within the society are being protected in those informal processes. Um, and what is the degree to which government oversight is necessary in order to ensure that judgments rendered in those settings are in fact enforceable for the litigants. That is the challenge. But to substitute formal capacity or to believe that we have to substitute formal capacity actually puts a weight on the formal system that in most cases most of these countries cannot support and can't sustain. And so that's why I have very, very strong opinions on this. Thanks. Can I get a chance to sure. uh, rebuttal? Yeah, you get a pop rebuttal. back in here. <laughs> I, nothing in that point I'm making has to do with the delegitimizing um, ways of ADR, ways of resolving things outside of court. Of course, all of these matters, the, the vast majority of them, are not going to get resolved in court. But when we say education is important, and all we do and when we educate is tell people your laws are illegal and you can't change them because you, that's what customary law is, then you're undercutting the legitimacy of the law that the people have. And I think what's unique about South Africa's approach to customary law is they say your law can change, you have the power to change it, and you have the, matter, the power to make it consistent with these international standards and constitutional standards that you say are important you know, must be met at the end of the day. Because the problem is many of these customary systems fail the test to meet those standards. And then everyone tells them these aren't the laws, yet the people, you know, so even if they're not going to the high court or the Supreme Court, 
I think it makes a difference if they know their system is legitimate legally or not. If they know that legitimate, their system is just is just a, is just something that's fake that that they have it, but everybody knows it's not really legal at the end of the day. I think it disempowers that system to work at the grassroots level. So, sir, rebuttal. Michelle. Oh, well, I mean, I, I, I think. <laughs> I'm, you know, we're talking about a very specific context here when you're talking about Uganda um, and the, you know, what's legal, what's not. Um, but, you know, I do think that we need to proceed with caution on this. Um, and I also think that when you, if, if you haven't reconciled customary law and customarily accepted practices with your formal legal system, then when you send people into the formal system, you're still going to get decisions that end up being based on that sense of equity that comes out of the informal system. And if rights are not being upheld in the formal system, it actually undercuts and weakens the legitimacy of the formal system as well, and it throws people back into the informal system. So at the end of the day, the two have got to work. I mean, they have to be reconciled. That really has to be the movement, but that does not mean one replaces the other. You know, some things just kind of jump out at you. <clears throat> and one of the things that uh, Michelle talked about was uh, was settling a multi-million dollar claim for season tickets to Bush Gardens. Now, I practiced law for 25 years and never had a settlement quite like that. But I never went to Regent Law School either. <laughs> Who's next? Uh, thank you very much. Michael. I, I just wanted to say something about uh, the two and, and his question. Uh, I, I just give two illustrations uh, about uh, the, the conflict between the two, the customary and, uh, and the formal. Uh, my resident state attorney, prosecutor, uh, was handling a session and uh, there were these uh, defilement cases. So she had very good cases, the witnesses, police file and everything and she met them the day before. So she calls me and she's crying and she says, uh, these people have embarrassed me before the judge. I was with them yesterday. We went through the statements and they were ready to testify. Now before the judge, the victim herself says, I don't know the accused person. I've never seen him. Mm -hmm. The mother of the victim who has a statement, police statement on file says, that is not my statement. And uh, poor girl is, is, she says, why didn't they tell me yesterday when I was talking with them? And they wait to come to court and they, they deny me. And uh, so I had one of my senior prosecutors, a lady, who for her, she says she can't take that nonsense. So she ordered the mother to be locked up for perjury and so on. <laughs> okay. But again, how many battles do you want to fight? That's mm -hmm. what I was telling her. Uh, fighting the accused person now you are fighting your own witnesses so but basically if your witnesses have decided they will not cooperate with you and most likely it's because they have informally settled the matter with the community and uh, the other matter again was uh, one one girl I got information that they had made her sign an additional statement saying she was not interested in the matter and uh, because she was illiterate so some people brought her to my office and uh, we worked out, we were going to arrest whoever was involved. Then after we had worked out everything, I, I thought, well, let me just ask her this, uh, you know, routine. Are you willing to testify against the person who committed this uh, offense against you, uh, rape? And of course I knew we had gone through this. It was routine. I knew she would say yes. But the girl said no. And uh, she came with people had brought her and we were working on this case and everybody was shocked. And I said, why? And she says, uh, these people can kill me. I'm afraid I, uh, I stay with my mother and our door is not true. Basically, she was scared. The, we could prosecute the perpetrator, but after that, were we going to protect her if they came after her? And I could see she was completely scared. She would rather leave the matter than try to pursue it. So uh, that uh, tension between the two, 
we deal with it every day and, and, and you wonder which, which side to go, but you have to keep moving on. You win some, you lose some. Well said. Let me kind of wrap a bow around this because I think this is a really important, important discussion um, and, and a critical issue. So what works in this? And one of, to me, one of the most interesting things that I've seen, and I saw this in, my, um, in some of my work in Ethiopia, and then I saw it again in Afghanistan, was I saw situations where the judge, the prosecutor, and the police chief or the chief investigator in a community, even though they were there, they were empowered, they were trained, certified in everything, they made a decision that they would take all of the cases that came before them um, that were of any community interest to the local governing council, whether it was a tribal of elders, whether it was a community council, uh, you know, a, a council of elders or a, an elected community council. Um, and these were in places where the councils of elders and the community councils, the elected officials, had a lot of legitimacy. The people really felt they were representative. representative. And what they would do is they would bring these cases into the council, and the judge would advise the council on what the law was. The prosecutor would present the case, and the police officer or the chief investigator would lay out the evidence. But the ultimate decision was put to the community council or the council of elders. And in these instances, there is no way that that was legal technically under the law. But what it was, was it was a blending of informal and formal structures in that locality that had tremendous legitimacy in the community and it really served to do several things. It overcame the security barrier that was in place in Afghanistan, in particular this was key because when you had one prosecutor in a district or one judge and they were the ultimate decision makers, then as soon as they made an adverse decision, they had a target on their back. And so a lot of times you just couldn't get cases through or you couldn't get witnesses to come forward. But in this instance, what it did is it diffused responsibility for the decisions and put it on all of the community leaders. So now if you wanted to attack the decision, you had to attack the entire leadership of the community. Um, it also, you know, had that same, that similar effect when you had litigants who were worried about personal repercussions, whether a daughter becoming unmarriageable because of a sexual assault um, or, you know, something related, um, you know, or any of these things. Again, it put the problem before the community leaders that were recognized as legitimate. Um, and gave the case itself and the parties, it gave them, le conferred legitimacy on them that wouldn't have otherwise existed. Okay. One last question. Anybody else? Yeah, right here. I don't know if this mic is on. Nope. Okay. Yeah. Is it? Can it you is. hear? It is. We yeah. hear you. Okay. Thank um, you. So I think this is a hugely important topic, the um, topic of customary justice. And, and, um, and one comment that I wanted to make is, um, I think it's important in the discussion to distinguish between that which is going on within a country by people from the country and that which the international community is doing. Um, these are two different things. Um, and you know what we're hearing um, you know, for the comments about what's going on in Uganda and how Ugandans themselves are, are struggling with and working with dealing with customary justice and formal justice, that's one very important but very separate category. The concerns that I have and how I've looked at this issue is more in that other category of what internationals are doing in relation to customary justice. And my concern really comes to a lot of what Michelle's talking about, which is recognizing the complexity of what's going on um, in these customary processes. Um, certainly in our own country, and what is one percent of civil cases go to trial, three to five percent of criminal cases go to trial, and most cases don't even become formal disputes, right? They're, people have a disagreement with their neighbor, they're handling it some other way, right? So this is how it happens around the world, including in our own country. But when um, internationals go to a country that they're not from and they're working on these issues, they rarely recognize, certainly in the early time that they're working in the country, the complexity of the society in which they're working and the complexity of these informal dispute resolution processes. And I think it's important that we um, are very conscious of this and hesitant to get involved in that which, as outsiders, it's very difficult to understand. Um, and I am very cautious and urge caution in, in 
doing project projects and programs that involve these informal dispute resolution processes, not because they aren't important in the everywhere, um, but because it's difficult to understand them as an outsider, and particularly when so many of the folks who do this kind of work, myself included, don't speak the languages of the places we are. That's how can you even begin to understand a society when you don't even speak the language, much less all the other complexity involved. So, so that was just my um, kind of point of caution in, in the discussion. Yeah, I think it's hugely important to know what your role, if you, if you say, I want to help in Africa, <laughs> You can hurt in so many ways just by saying, I want to go do something. I mean, you really have to be very smart about how you help. Uh, and, uh, but I think one thing to, 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 to put another bow on the, on the big issue, I think what can be confusing is we talk about customary forms of resolution versus customary substantive law. And I think that's where our, our disconnect was because customary forms of resolution, yes, they're there and they're happening. And they're good because they get things resolved. They may just be relational. Nobody might be involved. It can happen a million ways. But the substantive law says, who owns the property? Are you actually married? Can this person get this? And it affects relationships if it's delegitimate. If, if the law, if you know that the law says you have this, actually you, that law isn't good, it changes the relationship so that the negotiation would be affected if everybody in America knows, oh, wait, you know, uh, you know, women can't own cars, and you all know that, well, it's gonna change the way you negotiate about cars with women if they can't own cars. So I think it's, it's two different things. It's the substantive, the substantive piece is a law, is a, is a substantive law that's still there. It says who, who gets what, and then there's what we like to think about when we think of Kachaka, and you know, we think about what happened in South Africa, we think about Ubuntu, I think it's more accessible for us. And as like people like Jessica know, they plugged into the substantive world. It is incredibly complicated. And the only people that know are the people on the ground. And the question is whether the people on the ground have the power to take control of their law in some way or whether they're at the mercy of whoever else says whether their law is good or not. And that's what Jessica basically worked on all, you know, all summer, last summer. But it is, she can, she can attest to it. It's incredibly complicated and you've got to be incredibly, you don't, you don't weigh in on it, you let the people that know it, you know, uh, be the ones that work it out. But anyway. Kevin, Edward, any last words? Well, I haven't said much because I'm sitting here thinking that uh, I'm even going to complicate the situation further. <laughs> I mean, because, because I look at customary law and uh, the, it is being affected by all the external forces. I mean, if you look at property, it's not that they have denied you where you live, you can move to the next one. Now, every place in the village that used to be a forest, somebody owns it. So resources are being constrained as the populations grow. So really, I mean, that mechanism is being constrained too, is that as we grow up, I mean, our children can't speak Luganda. They don't know it. It's f completely foreign, you know? So you are raising up a generation, I mean, that more people are leaving the rural and coming to the urban. So that, there's more Western influence, you know, than cultural influence. However, if you send, if the king, we have a king, now if that king, there was a dispute, and he went on that village and sat in that, in that dispute, I bet it would be settled. Everybody respects him. Now the challenge is he used to have a representative in every village who used to have equal powers and would be respected. Today, he not, does not have that much respect. Now a few institutions are being restored, but I don't think that they can come back to that place. I mean, when people see the king, they'll prostrate, whether it is in the, in the, you know, they will do everything, whether they're in suits. That is respect they give to him. But beyond that, it's difficult to see where that goes. So it's going to be a mix and match. And then the, the, the country needs to recognize that, yes, we want to go back to that system. It can do something for us. It has to be a blend and an understanding. That will bring uh, some sense of justice for that community that really does not have uh, uh, the same educational background 
and can appreciate laws in the same way. But it kind of has to be a mix of, of, of systems and bring something to work.